Hello Ecotopians. Today we will be studying the soils in Ecotopia. This being a part of the uh, abiotic component of the ecology of redwoods. And abiotic, to remind you, means the non-living part. Technically soils are not non-living, but since we just studied geology, which are the rocks, the non-living parts, uh, we're going to um, continue on the study of geology into the soils. And uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, so let's see. Soils for Ecotopia. Let's go like this. Okay, so as uh, a reminder from last time, we studied the, the uh, earth geology, and we had this cutout picture of the earth, and we, show, we saw there that the crust of the earth um, is a very thin part of the earth relative to the rest of the earth. Still pretty darn thick from our point of view as we crawl around the surface of the earth like ants. Um, but thinner still is the soil. Um, soils have been described as the skin of the earth, which I think is a kind of an awkward analogy because the skin on humans sort of protects us from the outside and keeps our inside in, and that's not what soils on the earth do it at all. Um, however, the point is true that the soil on earth is an extremely thin layer, and yet all terrestrial life, and this is important, all terrestrial life on Earth depends upon soil. Just think about that. All terrestrial life, that's you and me and redwoods and pelicans and newts and grasses and elephants and everything depends upon soil. Why is that? Because plants depend upon soil and the rest of us depend upon plants. So even if you eat cheese and meat and eggs and milk and that kind of stuff, um, and you think you can get by without plants, which is kind of crazy, you can't because all those things that you're eating depend upon plants. No plants, no cheese, no you. Okay, so we depend upon soil, and in this lecture we will um, come hopefully to a greater understanding of what soil is and how redwoods depend upon them. So what we're going to talk about is what is soil defining it, how does it form, and what does it do for redwoods. That's the goal of this lecture. So um, what is soil? So first of all, do you remember from the geology lecture when I introduced the four classical elements? Do you remember what the four classical elements are? One, two, three, and four. It was the earth, the air, the fire and water. Okay, a useful way of looking at the world. I'm introducing a new useful way of looking at the world, the four spheres. Spheres being uh, like round things, only three dimensions. So um, the four spheres are the atmosphere, the lithosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere. Let's define them. I think you know what the atmosphere is. It's the air. Lithosphere, litho means rock. So a lithosphere is the earth. The hydrosphere is the water part of the planet. And in the middle, uh, Professor Doofelschmertz would say, this is not a sphere, but well, whatever, um, the biosphere. So the point is that the living parts of the Earth contain components of the atmosphere, the lithosphere, and the hydrosphere. And soil is the same way. When we study soil, it is uh, useful to understand that dirt, don't call it dirt, call it soil. Soil uh, compo is composed of stony parts, watery parts, airy parts, and living parts. Really, all those things together are very important components of soil. We're going to start with a lithosphere. Um, so to really understand what soil is, it's useful to just think about how it forms. I'm going to lead you through soil formation, which involves the interaction of a parent material, a climate, topography, and biology. So let's just go through these. Yikes. There we go. Okay, so we talked about parent material last time when we talked about geology. You may remember these images. This was basalt from extrusive igneous rock. This was intrusive igneous rock. Uh, here's an example of granite. And um, also sedimentary rock we talked. This is a sandstone. And I just have a special thing for limestone because calcium carbonate is limestone. It's really important in the carbon cycle. 
Uh, it's really important to soils. This is a place in Turkey. There's some hot springs here that are giving off um, calcium carbonate that, that builds up into a deposit, I think, called travertine. Uh, absolutely gorgeous. And uh, soils derived from limestone um, are really strange. Limestone rock often forms caves, and the soils derived from it are really wacky. We don't have a lot of it here in Redwood Country, so I'm not going to talk much more about it. But anyway, the parent material is the original rock from which the soil was formed, and the, thus the chemical properties of soil depends upon the parent material. Not all rocks have the same minerals in them, so soils derived from them will have very difficult components. So for instance, a soil derived from limestone is extremely poor. It's very bad for plant growth, uh, whereas soils derived from uh, extrusive igneous rock uh, tend to be very fertile. It's where your pineapples come from and your macadamia nuts from Hawaii. Okay, we also talked last time about how weathering was important to um, rocks to geology and I show you this picture of uh, physical weathering showing how this rock breaks down. And you can imagine first it breaks down like this and then it breaks down again and then it breaks and breaks and breaks and breaks until finally have itty bitty tiny small particles. And I talked to you about um, these lichens growing on a rock, giving off chemicals that dissolve the rock. And so there's chemical weathering. And some people talk about biological weathering as well. And in the end, we can get an extremely weathered soil that is one that has been broken down into very small particles and also has lost a lot of its original components due to weathering and leaching from water and so forth. So uh, that's the second process of soil formation. First is the formation of the rocks. The second is its weathering into small particles. So weathering reduces rocks to three small size classes, sand, silt, and clay. And I have a little picture here of those three. Uh, so you have held sand before, no doubt, and you've noticed that it's uh, composed of little particles. Well, if they were even smaller, they would be silt. Uh, and if they're even smaller, they would be clay. And if, they were this, if this were a soils class, you would have to memorize how big they are, but not for this class. Um, just know the three size components. Clay is, it is, the individual particles of clay are microscopic. Silt, you can barely see under the microscope. Sand, you can see with the naked eye. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out in this slide are these arrows here that are pointing out the air spaces or the spaces in between the particles. Extremely important to soil properties that there is space between the particles. That means that water, as it hits the soil, can percolate through the soil. It means that when this water is gone, it's replaced with air, which allows the microbes and the plants and the other things that are in the soil to actually breathe, which they need to do. And it also allows plants and other organisms to penetrate the soil. Now, in an extreme case like clay, a pure clay soil, there's practically no space between the particles, and so it does not allow water to percolate through it. So that water might run off and become erosive and carry things away with it. Uh, but clay can hold a lot of water, whereas water just sort of runs through sand and doesn't stick around. So that soils with more clay in them actually have a higher water holding capacity and will stay wet for longer than its sandy soil will, which will dry out very quickly. And that is, uh, has a big uh, effect on the plant community that grows on various kinds of soil. Please know that most soils are a mixture of sand, silt, and clay. There are some that are pure clay, that are, there are some that are pure sand, and others that may be pure silt, but usually there's some mixture of these two. Any particular soil will be a mixture of these things. And they also tend to clump together. Uh, sand and silt and clay might clump into little balls called aggregates. And these create little microclimates for microbes. And it affects soil properties. And if this were a soil class, we'd go into detail, but not right now. We'll move on. So uh, we talked about the parent material and that there are different minerals and different parent materials. But the ones I wanted to point out in particular were the nutrients needed for all life. Now, these, this abbreviation, C-H-N-O-P-S, calcium and magnesium, are abbreviations for elements in the rock. And they are the elements that make up most living tissue. 
uh, C, H, and O are um, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. And if you know anything at all about uh, human nutrition, you should know that C, H, and O are what make up carbohydrates. So sugars and starches and lipids and even a lot of proteinaceous matter is composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Now, these are derived from the atmosphere by the most amazing, magical process on the planet, photosynthesis. Uh, so all these plants out here, they're green because they do photosynthesis and they're able to take C, H, and O out of the atmosphere and turn it into yummy stuff like sugar. So that's great, but that doesn't really get to what we're talking about, which is which one of these, um, which of these nutrients derive from rock. And that would be um, phosphorus, sulfur, calcium, and magnesium. We absolutely need these nutrients. They must get into our bodies or we're dead. Um, phosphorus is important in energy and in bones. It's, uh, sulfur is a component of skin and hair um, and nails and calcium, of course, bones and magnesium uh, for photosynthesis and magnesium also, let's see, in many of the energetic reactions in our bodies. So uh, we need these and we get them from our food and our food ultimately comes from the soil. So this is muy importante, so that we uh, get these things. Okay, so, and, and even redwood trees need all these elements, and they need these P, S, calcium, and magnesium from the soil. So I will not ask you to memorize these nutrients. I'm just going to speak to them more generally as nutrients. And so you should know that uh, um, new, these many nutrients come from the soil, and uh, they're derived from, ultimately, the original parent material, the rock. Okay, I also mentioned topography last time, and uh, this time I'm just going to say that topography is important in soil formation because it's involved in the transport, the sorting, the accumulation, the reworking, and the loss of soil. So in this picture you can see a hill with a top, a side, and a bottom. And you can just imagine soil forming here through the processes we've already discussed. Uh, and on the slopes, over time, this soil is going to move downstream. It is not going to move up the hill. Ultimately, it's going to move down the hill through some um, helpers that we'll talk about later. And as it gets to the bottom, it will start accumulating. So, uh, and then streams will come through and they will pick up soil rock particles and work it, break it down, dissolve things out of it, move it around, and sort it. And um, so I can show you this diagram, and I think you should study it and think about it, but I also wanted to show you some examples on the planet of where this kind of stuff happens. Let's, let's go over to Redwood Country, Founders Grove, which is just off Highway 101, uh, a little bit south of Fortuna. And let me back out a little bit so you can see where it is. So let's see, I think CR is, College of the Redwoods is, that's Fortuna here, and College of the Redwoods is a little bit up, and Eureka is up here. Okay, so drive south along the Eel River on 101, and hopefully you've done this at least once, or you'll do that in this class. Come visit Founders Grove. And I just wanted to show you, let's look at it vertically. Founders Grove is part of the Redwood National and State Parks and is really an outstanding area for looking at redwoods um, because it is, in, it is in an ideal area for redwoods to grow. Um, what makes it good for redwoods is it is at the junction of two rivers. And so the rivers here are bringing soil down from the hills, they're working it, Periodically, there are floods over the last thousands of years. Many times, this river has left its banks and come up into the forest and deposited um, really nutritious um, soil into the grove. So uh, it's also sheltered, let's see if we can show you this, from the winds, so strong winds that come off the ocean are blocked by these mountains. I'll give you some more view of the relief here. Uh, and so the big tall trees don't uh, blow down so much. Okay, so there's a big wind, big hills here, or mountains, are protecting the redwoods from blowdown. And also they get good water because they're near the river. 
and also they're close enough to the ocean that the summer fogs can come on up this valley and that is really important to redwood growth as we will talk about later. Okay, so that's Founders Grove and it's just a great place and great big gigantic trees are in there. Um, but I also just want to show you that here's the Eel River, one of the forks of the Eel River, and you can see that in summertime here it's low, uh, but it is moving gravel down from the mountains, all these mountains here, to the sea. And as it does so, it breaks them up, it rounds them, it produces um, silt particles and sand particles and clay particles from it, and the heavy stuff stays behind and the lighter stuff goes forward. And so let's just come over here to near the Ferndale area, Fortuna and Ferndale, as the river comes out, when a big flood comes, it just would normally, before humans have, have diked it up, um, the flood would spread throughout this delta area. And as it spread out, um, there are areas where the water moves very fast. Areas that move very fast will carry heavier particles. Areas that move very slow will not carry heavier particles, and so they'll carry the lighter particles over here and then deposit them. So areas like this, it's very fertile, rich farmland, full of dairy cows and pastures and meadows, um, has received smaller soil particles than are in the channel here. And so that's more of a silty or sandy soil than you'd get here where you get all the rocks. Okay, I just want to show you a couple more places on the earth. One a little farther away uh, is a valley I know something about. It's called Deep Springs Valley. This is the Central Valley of California, and here are the Sierra Nevada. And to the east, uh, we get the Basin and Range District, or the Great Basin. And in this valley here is really has uh, some good examples of how um, water will sort soil particles. Okay, let me just tilt in here. Okay, so these are mountains up here and they actually are, are sedimentary and you can actually see the layers of the sedimentary rocks. And uh, this canyon cuts through these mountains and water through the millennia breaks down the rocks, physical weathering, and then transports the stuff nowadays in flash floods that come down into this desert valley. The flash floods carrying all kinds of debris, boulders and rocks, enters the valley and as soon as the water spreads out the boulders and heavier rocks stop and so if you go hiking in this area it's very rocky and uh, as you come down here you can see where the water came down here comes down here and it deposits sand here and so if you walk around here it's very sandy and if you work your way all the way down to the bottom of this valley there's a, a dry lake here and it's extremely muddy I've walked in this and it's totally mud so that's clay so you can see that the water here is sorting the mineral particles into rocks sand silt and clay and that happens all over the world. On a, the greatest scale in North America, you can look at the Mississippi River, which drains the watersheds of, I can't, I've lost count, whoops, of 20-odd uh, states. It's huge. And uh, to the west, we have the Rocky Mountains, and so much of the Mississippi River headwaters are in the Rocky Mountains, doing what I just showed you in Deep Springs Valley, transporting boulders and rocks and gravel and sand and silt downstream, always downstream. Also, uh, um, waters from the Ohio River come down, too, into the Mississippi River. And over the millennia, um, the Mississippi River changes course all the time, just until humans have, have diked it. And you can see anywhere all these abandoned water courses of the Mississippi River. Uh, even now, even with the Army Corps of Engineers and all its efforts, we get floods on the Mississippi River and vast areas of this will be flooded out. And we feel for, sorry for the people whose homes are flooded, but from an ecological point of view, it's a natural event that is simply reworking the soils and rocks in this area, actually bringing fertility to areas that may have lost it. Uh, and it's very fertile. Uh, anywhere you go, if you come on down, you can see the farmland because this is just great. Uh, river bottoms are great farmland. They're very silty. They have perfect soil properties for growing plants. 
Also, they tend to be very young soils, which means they haven't lost their nutrients. Why are they young? Because of the ice ages. Uh, only about 14,000 years ago did the ice, uh, the ice sheet retreat from this area that gouged out the Great Lakes and the, the Finger Lakes of, of Ithaca. And um, they've, when the glaciers were here, they were grinding the rocks into a flower and a flowery soil, which then came out here. Very young rock, but it ground to just the perfect consistency, full of nutrients, and it's just great for farmland. And so all throughout the Midwest, in Google Earth, anywhere you go, that's farmland. Those squares are farmland. Incredible fertility, which has uh, fueled the progress of civilization. Okay, let's go back to our PowerPoint. Okay, so topography is important in soil formation via transport, sorting, accumulation, reworking, and loss. Okay, also just wanted to say soil forms very slowly, about one inch in 500 years. It depends where you are and what specific processes are occurring, but in general, uh, no one, uh, there's no disagreement that soil forms very slowly. It can be lost very quickly by human mismanagement, uh, and that's a huge problem worldwide. Uh, that's not a part of this course. We're not really going to go into it, um, but it's just a good figure to know about it. An inch in 500 years is natural soil formation. So climate affects how rapidly soils form and how rapidly nutrients are lost from soils. And basically, higher temperatures and rainfall increase the rates of soil formation as well as uh, loss of nutrients. Just think of putting sugar in water. If you put it in coffee or tea, it melts very quickly. Whereas if you put it in cold water, it dissolves very slowly. Not melt, dissolves. Um, so higher temperatures, higher rainfall increases the rate at which nutrients are removed from rocks and washed ultimately into the ocean. So the, the loss of nutrients is inevitable, but can be accelerated by human activities, as I uh, suggested earlier. Okay, so we've been going on for a while now. Um, it's really a good idea to, uh, if you're losing your attention, to stop, take a break, and come back. I hope you take that opportunity right now. Me, I'm going to continue on. Okay, so we have covered three of the of the four spheres and soil formation, the atmosphere, the hydrosphere being, being the spaces in between the soil particles, and the lithosphere, the rocky parts of soil. So now we need to talk about the biosphere, the biological component of soils. And uh, yeah, ooh, ah, uh, worms. <coughs> oh, honestly, tell me you, you didn't suspect that I was going to show you a picture of worms. We're talking about soils after all, but uh, after you suffer for a few more seconds looking at these worms, I'll uh, put you out of your misery and show you that um, there's more than just worms involved in soil. Uh, earthworms alone can turn over the top six inches of soil completely in 10 to 20 years. Now I think about that. There's a field and in 10 to 20 years, the top six inches is just going to be turned over by earthworms. Okay, so what? Well, that's actually really important in a lot of different ways. They are opening up cavities for water to infiltrate. Um, they're preventing nutrients from being lost in downward um, and so forth. But worms are not alone in doing this. All kinds of other organisms contribute to soil movement. Uh, my friend the gopher, uh, uh, which anyone who gardens knows I'm being facetious, uh, moles do it. All kinds of rodents and, and vertebrates will turn over soil. Um, not shown here are the thousands of other insect species like ants, beetles, that are continuously stirring up the dirt. Also know that trees, uh, trees live and die and when they die they fall over and when they fall over they pull up a root wad and that might not seem like a lot of soil movement to you but if you think of the entire forest living and dying within the span of a couple hundred years or so uh, that can be actually quite significant the amount of soil picked up and then spilled down the slope um, all contributes to soil movement so soil moves by living creatures and it's, this is just a crazy picture of some, just some of the organisms that live in soil. 
all these organisms are ultimately fed by plants. Now, I know that centipedes and mites and beetles and worms are disagreeable to a lot of people, so I'm just going to forward the slide here and we can look at something pretty while I talk about the importance of the soil community to soils. So uh, all these plants, the redwoods, the ferns, all the plants in the forest are doing photosynthesis and they are growing. Please know that they are growing underground as much as they're growing above ground. And so they're pumping nutrients into the soil, uh, carbohydrates and wood and whatever they they get from photosynthesis, whatever they grow goes into the soil. And they drop leaves and they drop sticks and they die. So everything above ground ultimately finds its way into the soil. And that is food for that community that lives down below. Yes, you might think it's icky. That's just a human thing. But just try to get over that emotional reaction and think of the soil community as being like an extraterrestrial environment where all kinds of weird alien species are getting along and doing things in a way that's unknown to us. Well, one of the things they do is they break down biological material. Um, they eat and they poop and they die and then their poop is eaten by someone else or their bodies are eaten by somebody else and there's a continuous trading of nutrients. One of the waste products that accumulates that nobody can digest is called humus. You probably have heard of this before. Um, if it has an extra M in there, it's called hummus, and it's a food you get in the grocery store. Um, but with only one M, it's called humus. And humus is um, a very complicated biomolecule that nobody can digest, and so it accumulates in the soil. So what's so what about it is that it contributes wonderful properties to the soil. It increases water holding capacity. It increases the aeration of the soil. It's kind of spongy, so it doesn't compress the soil. The soil can't compress very much if it's got a lot of humus in it. And humus holds on to nutrients that might otherwise be lost as water moves through, through the soil. So this is kind of miraculous uh, that life itself, by its normal processes, would contribute to the soil a compound that promotes life itself. By improving soil properties, it's promoting life. And so that's a kind of a positive feedback, which I think is a really cool aspect of soil. Okay, so that's part of the biosphere of soil, is that the life itself in soil contributes to the soil important chemical properties that make it more fertile. That's a big deal. Okay, so we're about done here. We have uh, talked about the four spheres of soil. Um, you know that the atmosphere and hydrosphere, that there is air and water in soil, and that's important to all that community of organisms that live down there, that they have air and water. Soil is formed ultimately from rock, and the living part, the biosphere of soil, contributes to the properties of the soil in many important ways, which I have just scratched the surface of. So in uh, conclusion here, I want to ask, what does soil do for redwoods, and what do redwoods do for the soil? So what soil does for redwoods is it provides anchorage, so these enormous 300-foot trees, it's good that they are anchored to something or they will fall over. Uh, and they hold on to the soil and the rocks underneath it. Uh, the soil provides nutrients to these guys, so not the ones from the atmosphere, but the other ones. These enormous trees contain a lot of nutrients that they have sucked up out of the soil, and they will give it back to the soil when they die, and so it isn't lost from this ecosystem. And thirdly, soil provides water. Um, the soil will receive the water from rainfall, and it will store that water, uh, so soil actually has a water holding capacity, and then in turn it will supply that water to plants. It also purifies the soil and replenishes the aquifer and so on, but directly to redwoods, it's receiving the water, it's, it could run off, but it doesn't, it percolates into the soil, it is held by the soil, and it's supplied to the tree and other plants as well. So what do, uh, what do redwoods do for the soil? Well, they're continuously pumping the soil full of organic matter, so they are feeding the soil. And that fooding, feeding of organic matter, ultimately in conjunction with the rest of the soil community, uh, uh, creates humus, which improves soil properties. 
The trees are anchored by the soil, but they also anchor the soil. The roots of the trees actually hold on to the soil so that during a flood, the soil isn't all washed away. Very, very important. It reduces erosion. The uh, redwoods retain nutrients in their biomass. So if about 1% of wood remains after you burn it off. When you burn wood, the carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen is lost, leaving behind all the rest of the nutrients. So 99% of wood is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, and 1% are these other nutrients. And so there's not very many of them out there, and most of the creatures out there are very hungry for these nutrients. And so they are stored in the biomass of the trees and returned to them upon the death of the trees. Uh, also, um, the trees, redwoods, gather more soil during floods. By just being there, they slow down the water and that allows silt to settle out during floods. And uh, thirdly, the, the redwoods create an enormous canopy over the soil and they cool or keep the soil cooler than it would otherwise be with the sun beating directly down on it. So by shading the soil and also transpiration in a kind of a quasi form of evaporation keeps the area underneath the, the redwood forest cooler than it would otherwise be. And so probably although the redwoods do suck up a lot of water out of the soil um, in the aquifer and release it um, while they're growing, perhaps overall the presence of redwood forest increases water availability. Maybe or maybe not. We'll be talking more about soil relations and climate in uh, next week. Okay, um, so that's it. I just wanted to conclude here that um, we are concluding the, uh, well, we have one more lecture on abiotic uh, parts of, uh, abiotic components of redwood forests. Soon we'll be talking about the biotic components, the interaction of living things more carefully. Uh, but soon we'll be talking about climate too um, and the interaction of the climate and the redwoods. Really fascinating, really important. And I just wanted to reward those of you who have listened all the way to the very end of this um, video that if you email, uh, send me an email in this with a subject line of yes please, I will send you a virtual chocolate. And this is my way of checking to see if anyone's actually watching these videos. Okay, uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. I did want to lastly say that um, Wikipedia is a great source of information for lots of things and I've looked over their soil entry. goes into much more detail than I have, but if you want more detail, that's a good place to get it. Okay, ciao for now.